Hi ladies, you're listening to The Goodness Podcast. My name is Noor Tahini. I'm the co-founder of Goodness and I'll be your host today. Goodness was launched in 2018 as a platform dedicated to tackling topics surrounding women's health in a real and honest way. And we're continuing on that mission with the launch of this podcast series, which will feature real women and real stories from the Middle East. My guest on the podcast today is Najla Musa, a longtime Goodness collaborator and colleague, as well as the creator of relationship blog Truly Madly Honestly. Najla is a mom of two girls, as well as a wife, which is mostly what we'll be focusing on today. Through her studies with the Gottman Institute, a new research-based approach to couples therapy, Najla has been learning a lot about how to build better relationships, and she'll be sharing those tips in today's podcast. Hi, Najla. Hi, Noor. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. For having us in your beautiful home. Thank you. Thank you. So today is your eight-year wedding anniversary, right? Yes. You guys have any plans tonight? Um, not as of yet, surprisingly. Uh, it's a very low-key wedding anniversary this year, as opposed to the past. It used to be such a production. Um, but this year, we're going to do something, obviously, but we just haven't planned anything yet. What do you normally do for your wedding anniversary? What have you done in the past? So in the past, we've gone as far as traveling. We would plan trips around our anniversary. That was really fun. And then kids came, and then financial um, responsibility came. And so uh, we usually go out to dinner or do um, a day somewhere by the beach or at the pool or something. Yeah. And how come you decided not to really do something as big this year? It's funny because I actually think ever since I started getting into relationships and couples therapy and learning and getting certified, my relationship has been the best it's ever been. And weirdly enough, it just, it just doesn't matter that we do something so big. I don't think it's so much the the anniversary itself as how you honor your commitment during the year and how little you take each other um, for granted because we do in all relationships that happens but uh, it's what you do every other day I guess outside the anniversary that matters more than that one day. How do you guys celebrate each other on like a on a day-to-day basis is there anything special that you do for each other or? Yes um, I think my husband's much better at it than me I think um Every morning we are affectionate, so he always hugs me and we hug each other. He'll give me a kiss before I leave the house with the kids. Even if I'm like cranky or rushing, it's something that is a tradition with us. Um, We talk on the phone uh, probably an unhealthy amount of times uh, to check in and he'll tell me what he's doing or if there's a change in plan. So we're always on the phone with each other. So we pretty much know each other's days very well. yeah, I guess so. And then we, we give each other compliments. Not all the time, obviously. I think he's, again, better at that than me. I'm, I'm kind of a complainer, I have to say, that about myself. But uh, yeah, I think it's the little things, right? That's how we honor each other. Physical affection, a hug, um, a word of empathy. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. We'll be good about that. I feel like out of all the podcasts that we've recorded this season, this is probably the one that's going to be forwarded to husbands the most. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm worried now. I'm worried what I'm going to say and how it's going to, you know. Yeah. Affect. But the thing is, like, research just has shown that, generally speaking, couples, even good couples, will do things that, you know, bad couples do. So we will still, you know, take each other for granted. We'll have screaming matches. We will say very mean things to each other. We will be critical and defensive. So people will do that. I do that. You know, there's no such thing as the perfect relationship. We should always strive for what we call the good enough relationship. So people who aren't doing this all the time, that doesn't mean that they're failing in their relationships, you know? Who aren't doing what? Who aren't always doing these little things for each other? Yeah, who aren't showing each other empathy or support or listening or um, not fighting. You know, So research has also shown, based on the Gottman Institute, so research coming out of that, that it's not what determines a good relationship is not how little you fight, but it's how you dialogue around your problems or conflict, right? So people in good relationships will fight just as much as people in bad relationships, right? Or not bad, I want to say in unhappy relationships. Or unhealthy. Yeah, yeah. or or negative relationships. Um, But... What differentiates them is what, I mean, John Gottman, Dr. John Gottman, who is, you know, behind the Gottman method, um, 
So he uh, coins them as the masters and the disasters of relationships, right? And so what he says is what separates masters from disasters is many things, but one of them is one of the biggest things is how they dialogue around their problems. So when they do fight or they have these horrible arguments or are mean to each other, how they come back from that um, and talk around that is what differentiates them. Are there, is there like an easy way to find out if you're a master or a disaster when it comes to arguments in your relationship? Yes. So some couples are natural masters. They just have that like instinctual way of dealing with each other. So they know how to handle conflict in this gentle and calm way. They choose their words very wisely and carefully. They treat their partner like a good friend. Uh, those are who we consider the masters. The disasters treat their partner like an enemy or an adversary, and they react rather than respond. They go into fight or flight mode whenever they feel threatened, emotionally threatened, mm -hmm. or when they feel vulnerable or frustrated or angry. So those are the ones who are the disasters. So you often hear the advice given to new couples, this piece of advice given to new couples, which is never go to bed angry with your spouse. What do you think about that? That's like the worst piece of advice ever, actually, contrary to popular belief, because this idea is when you are really upset, um, you are in a psychological state called flooding. And what flooded means is that you're emotionally overwhelmed. Um, technically, it is when your heartbeat is 100 beats per minute. And so it's very hard for you to take anything in that your partner is saying. It's also very hard for you to think about what you want to say and say it in a gentle, constructive way. So when you're flooded, there, and that's what usually happens when you're really angry or feeling helpless, or it's usually a combination of the two, helpless and angry, it's the worst time to have a conversation. So actually couples should say, you know what, I'm not ready to have a conversation now, but this is the difference, as opposed to just ignoring your partner and saying, I don't want to talk about this and going to bed, and your other partner really just wants to pick up and resolve this issue, which happens sometimes because we have different styles of conflict and how we deal with conflict. What you need to give your partner who wants to talk about this is a commitment to when you're going to pick up this conversation again. So they know that this is not something that's going to be forgotten, that this is something that you will honor, this conversation. And so you would say, I'm feeling flooded right now, or I feel like this is, I can't talk about this right now, I'm going to lose it. Can we pick up this conversation tomorrow at 7 a.m.? Or can we pick it up right after work? And you be very specific in terms of the time and place where you will have this conversation again. And that appeases your partner. And it gives you time to relax. Digest and as well. And do what we call self-soothing. And self-soothing is when you find a way to soothe yourself when you're feeling angry. And I just want to say this because I think it's very important. It doesn't work if you walk away and you think, ugh. Oh, he was or she was so rude. And you know what? When we pick up this conversation again, I'm going to say this and this and this. And oh, that's a great comeback. If you keep thinking of that conflict in itself, you're not actually relaxing. You're not soothing yourself. You're still in that zone mentally. And so you have to find different ways to disconnect from the argument, whether it's deep breathing, going for a walk, um, stretching, uh, doing an activity that distracts you. Otherwise, you're not coming. You're, you're not coming at it from a place of conflict resolution. You, you're coming. To, you're coming at it from a place of continuing the conflict and one-upping the partner. Right. You're just not in a place where you're soothing yourself to be calm enough to to have a constructive conflict, yeah. which is what we call. Right. So um, you know you have to keep in mind. Sixty-nine percent of our problems are perpetual, meaning they're not solvable. Sixty-nine percent of our problems will not be solved. Such as, it, well, for everyone it depends. It, everyone will have different conflicts and different reasons for why they feel very strongly about different things. Right. But generally speaking, the data shows that sixty-nine percent of our problems aren't solvable. So that the this whole idea that we have to solve all our problems, it doesn't work. That's how we fail. And you know, therapy in the past, and this is where the Gottman method, you know, I, I, maybe people don't know about the Gottman method, but the Gottman's are, the Gottman method is the first 
research-based approach to couples therapy. So back in the early 70s, John Gottman and one of his partners realized that there just wasn't any research. So people, therapists were coming up with theories on how to solve um, couples therapy and how to fix their problems, yeah. so to speak, but there was no research behind it, so it didn't work. So they have, they've researched 3,000 couples that they've kept in touch with for over a period of 40 years in something that they called a love lab. And based on that, they were able to come up with nine interventions that they used, right, to treat couples therapy. And what they found, there's so many interesting facts that have come out of this research. But one of them is this 69% of perpetual problems not being solvable. And in the past, people would go to a therapist and the therapist would tell them, okay, what's your problem? And they'll tell them their problem and then they'll try to resolve it or fix it. But it doesn't work. So what we really need to learn is how to talk about our problems and how to compromise, you know, and understand and accept that some things are just always going to be there. There will be things. You might have a partner that is continuously late to everything, mm. right? They're not going to necessarily change. So you have to figure out what it is that really bothers you about this. You know, there's always a core issue underneath these problems or these conflicts that aren't being um, solved, right? So would you say that Disney and Hollywood have basically painted the wrong picture of what a marriage is and have made it harder for people these days that have grown up on these movies and grown up with this pop culture to have a healthy relationship because we don't know what a good relationship looks like and we're all searching for a perfect relationship? Yes, so absolutely. Um, this idea of living happily ever after or these social media quotes or even your friends when people say, oh, you know, you deserve uh, to be with someone who doesn't hurt you. You deserve uh, to be with someone that makes you happy. This is so detrimental to a relationship because it puts so much pressure on this relationship to be everything that is outside of it, that is outside of its control. A person can't make you happy and their job isn't to make you happy. Their job is to add to your happiness. You know, this is what we need to understand. There, there is no such thing as someone who won't hurt you. That's also setting up ourselves for failure mm -hmm. in a relationship. You know, your partner will hurt you, will do things that you don't like. You will have conflict. You will question the relationship, right? So this idea that we need happiness in our relationship, and that is the goal, is so incorrect. The, the, the end goal is never happiness. Think about it this way. Happiness is like a, it's a moving, shifting emotion. It's not something that is constant, right? So it's impossible that someone will make you happy all the time. Um, at the same time, what you have to keep in mind is that we have uh, this idea that if our partner doesn't make us happy, that they, don't, that they don't love us. So I, I want to use an example from um, this book, The All or Nothing Marriage, by social psychologist Ellie Finkel. And he basically says that in today's world, couples expect their relationship to give them everything. Mm. Things that prior to the 20th century weren't put on the relationship. So your partner is expected to be your best friend and your lover and your confidant and your supporter and the adventurer and your comfort zone, you know? So all, things that actually oppose each other, right? And that puts so much pressure on the relationship. Esther Perel also says in Mating in Captivity, she also says something that I find very interesting. She says, today we turn into one person to, pro to provide what an entire village once did right? The sense of grounding, meaning, and continuity. And you expect your partner to give you meaning and ground you these things that you're supposed to give yourself, all right? And so many relationships will crumble under the weight of that expectation. So yeah, the goal isn't happily ever after. It's um, what you, the, the quote from Esther Perel is something that I heard as well in one of her, I think it was a TED Talk or a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And it stayed with me. And it's something I think about a lot. And it's something I talk to my married girlfriends about a lot as well, because you have this expectation that your husband is going to be the person you do everything with and they have the same preferences as you and they like the same music as you and they also want to go out clubbing with you and they want to go to Burning Man with you. Shout out to my husband who does not want to go to Burning Man at all. And I think there's no strong example of what we should be looking for. We, we all have no idea. We're kind of winging it. But if I look at my parents and if I look at my parents' generation back then and even my grandparents' generation, it seemed that the women were content with the man being the provider 
and father to the children, and not much more. You know, the social circles were so different. The men, the men hung out with the men, and they played taule, and they had their social uh, social circles, and then the women had their own, and then there were times when it overlapped, but it was, there was never as much pressure on the couple as there is today. Yeah, I, I look, I feel it's a double-edged sword. I feel like the more we learn about relationships, the more we can use it to our advantage. You know, I think in the past there was very clearly defined roles on what was a man's job and what was a woman's and what they did. And maybe that was easier so that the lines weren't blurred, but at the same time, it was very constricting, I think, for maybe some couples who didn't have that set path, right? But I think that now it's so much more dynamic and there's so much more that we could do based on what we know about relationships, right? We, we have this ability to be friends, real friends who spend time together, who, um, you know, who know each other inside out, who know each other's dreams and support each other, whether it's financially or just emotionally. So, so I think that there's so much that we know now that can better our relationship and take it to a level that our parents didn't actually have. But I also think the problem is that when you say how we expect our partner to give us everything we want or want the same things or have the same preferences, if you think about that, if you actually had that, that would be really boring. Yeah. If you asked your spouse, I want to do this, and every time they just said yes and went along with it, after a while it would be boring. The whole point of a relationship is it being dyma- dynamic, you know, ups and downs. Push and, and pull. And push yeah. and pull. And, and then it moves in different ways and you learn from each other. When your husband or your partner is so different than you, then you're able to get a new perspective on something. You're able to maybe learn and grow as a person. And actually that's what I wanted to say about relationships. The goal is always growth and growth only happens when you both are learning from each other and you're both learning from each other's experiences and and doing things differently. If you were able to get everything you wanted and everything was on your terms, nothing happens. You stay in the same place. And after a while, I think that relationship would be very boring and stagnant. You just keep floating in your own comfort zone, basically. Right. And it's not fun. If you're in a comfort zone all the time, it stops being fun because relationships have to grow. Almost like, you know, when you're dating, after a certain point, you think, okay, this needs to go somewhere else, right? It needs to keep growing. And then from dating, you might get engaged or you might move in together and then you'll get married, right? And then when you get married, I don't want it to be milestones like kids, promotions, buying a house together, but the relationship itself has to always ebb and flow and move somewhere, right? What is fair to expect from your marriage or from your spouse or from your partner? I think the most important thing is we need to expect support, empathy. We need to expect understanding with each other, but expectations itself set us up for failure Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's funny. We have all these expectations, but we never really verbalize what it is we need. You know, most people, when they argue or when they talk about their spouse, they are always talking from a negative perspective. So they're always complaining about what they're not getting. How often have you sat with your girlfriends, for example, for coffee, and they've just spent the whole time talking about how great their spouse is, or this amazing thing they did in the morning, or how they had this amazing conversation, or how their partner was so understanding about this thing or supported them so much. Even when these things happen, we don't talk about them. Maybe, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or it's just a relationship thing where we only talk about things from a negative perspective, and we stay in that complaining zone where we're always just you know, dragging our relationship down and talking about it from all the things we're not getting. And one of the things that's so important, even when we talk to our partners, is that we have to very clearly express the things we need in the relationship, not the things we are not getting, right? So if I want more attention from my spouse, I need to be very clear by saying, I need more time or more of your attention, as opposed to saying, you don't give me any attention. Mm. You don't give me any of your time right? That's more accusing. And that's the problem. If we talked about our needs, then our expectations would be so much easier to be met because we've communicated very clearly, very gently, which is important, and kindly what it is we need to feel loved in our relationship. Yeah. Right? That's and we so, don't do yeah, that. That's so true. Who, uh, there's a philosopher called Alain de Bolton. I think he has a pretty famous YouTube video called 
why you will probably marry the wrong person. Have you seen it? No. And he basically says, I'm pretty sure it's him. He basically says that because of this whole concept of soulmate, right? You expect you're marrying your soulmate. You expect that they can see into your soul and that they automatically know exactly what it is you need and exactly what it is you want. But you forget that the, you really have to spell it out very clearly for the other person to get it because they're not in your head and they're not in your soul and they, they're not just going to know what you need and what you want without you asking for it. Right. And people show love in different ways, right? And they, they want love in different ways. So maybe your partner is someone who wants presence, you know, for whatever reason, from a childhood trauma, from their own experience of their parents' relationship. For them, love is maybe shown through material things. They don't have to be expensive things, but that's their way. Maybe you're the kind of person who needs physical affection to be shown love, right? So if your partner gets you a present, but what you want is a hug, right? Yeah. You're, you're, that's you're not going to feel love. You're not going to feel love. And they're going to feel like, oh, she doesn't love me in return because I'm showing her love my way. Yeah. And that's part of also expressing our needs and how we want to be loved. It's very important. You know, one asks that, you know, at any point in your relationship, you never ask your partner, this is how I want to be shown love, or this is what love means to me. We, ne we never do that, right? We don't ask these things of our partners ever. And, you know, when you were talking about the soulmates. So early in the relationship, there's a phase called limerence, okay? And what limerence is, is the puppy love or the honeymoon yeah, phase. Yeah. And that can last typically up to two years. In that phase, you know how it is. You are so into that person. You want to spend every minute of the day with that person. You, the, their smell is something that really attracts you, you know, everything they say. You're in that phase, and it's, and it's all basically, there's all these chemicals. This limerence phase is all about the chemicals and endorphins, and there's so much going on that's making you feel that way, feel that infatuation. What happens in limerence is we ignore warning signs, right? We ignore all these warning signs. But then limerence ends after two years. And a lot can happen those two years. Maybe you'll be married. Maybe you'll have a kid, right? And then after those two years, when the limerence fades, that's when the real work of the relationship starts. And, that, and if there's a lot of warning signs that you've ignored, what happens is then you start thinking, oh my gosh, so there's all these things about this person that I really dislike. But you hate them because it started off with warning signs. But all this time while you're in this limerence phase, it's grown like a seed and it becomes contentment. And suddenly after two years, you go from infatuation to, I can't stand that person. I resent them, you know, for all these things that were there in my subconscious and I was aware of, but that I chose to ignore, right? And so at this point is when we have to say, this is where the real work of the relationship starts. And that's when I have to think, okay, is this person someone I can rely on? Is this person someone I trust? Is this person someone I want to be committed to or who is committed to me, yeah. right? And I think that's really the thing about soulmates. If we started our relationships, of course, there is attraction, right? And there is infatuation. But throughout that phase, we have to also be conscious of that person that we're with and whether we actually trust them, right? And trust and commitment aren't, they don't, they don't come as soon as the relationship starts, you have to be together for a period of time before you subconsciously ask yourself, do I trust this person? And that usually happens during fights. When you start fighting as a couple, that's when you'll realize, you'll ask yourself, do I, do I trust this person that they have my back? Or do I, do I feel like they're committed to me, right? And, and these are the questions that we have to be aware of and think about even from the very beginning. And I think that's how... That's how soulmates are born. I wouldn't say that you find someone and they're your soulmates. They transcend and they become your soulmates because of experience and because of all these things that you go through as a couple that show you or prove to you this person is there for you, that this person acts with your best interest at heart all the time, mm. right? Yeah. On the topic of fights, are you a master or a disaster in your couple? <laughs> God, I'm, I'm striving for master. Yeah. I'm striving for a masterhood. That's what I'm doing. Um, I think I, you know, I, I studied managing conflict. And now that I've completed Gottman Level Method 1 and 2, I know about all this stuff. And of course, like I said, no one has the perfect relationship. So sometimes I know that I'm doing something I shouldn't do and I'll do it anyway. But 
I think what's changed for me is this feeling of awareness. You know, my husband and I, we, our whole, our whole relationship when we were dating, we only dated for a year before we got married, was long distance. And then we got married. And when we were in long distance, and for everyone else out there who's long distance, they'll probably understand what I mean by this. But when you're together, you don't want to fight because your, your time together is so mm, precious and so limited. Yeah. So you're always, you know, with your best foot forward, you're always bringing your A game. You're trying to be the best version of yourself. And then you get married, which is what I did. And then, you know, all the gloves come off and then you realize, oh my God, who did I marry? Literally. And we moved into an apartment together. And we had no furniture. And I remember we were fighting about where to store the honey. This is a true story. So for me, my mom always put the honey in the fridge. And for him, really? he, yes, because of ants. It was the weirdest thing. And he always put it in the microwave. Like, as in, he stored it in the microwave. <laughs> and it became this huge, massive argument about the freaking honey, right? Yeah. And then I, I remember at one point I thought to myself, yeah, I get now why people will get divorced in their first year of marriage. It makes sense because I feel like I'm married to someone I literally don't know, right? And then there's a lot of pressure when you marry someone you need to live away from home because you don't want to talk about all, this, all these problems or all these things that are overwhelming you. And you feel almost disappointed and worried and scared and all that stuff. And I think that was a big thing for me. I think that my first two years of marriage, and I also got pregnant two months into my marriage. Oh, you guys don't waste time, huh? <laughs> At all. It was crazy. So I have two best friends who got married the same month as me. And I remember very clearly on my first wedding anniversary, one of them was in Turkey with her husband. The other one was in the Maldives. And I was on the beach with my husband. We, my mom was in town, so we had the day to ourselves. And I was so self-conscious of my body. I was so so tired and I remember my mother-in-law called me because you had given birth you had just given birth I'd given birth okay. and my mother-in-law called me and I told her you know it's can you imagine I'm not on my first wedding anniversary I'm not only did I not only have a baby but my kid is two months old on my first wedding anniversary right and I remember what I really wanted was just uninterrupted sleep in a hotel room by myself Right. And so that period was really dark for me. I, you know, when you have a kid and I think for a lot of people, having kids really affects the relationship. And there's so many courses on this. Right. Because it's such a big thing. You for me as a woman, I felt like because it had happened so early, I felt like, wait a minute, is my life mapped out for me already? So this is it. You know, I'm just going to have children And then I'm just going to live and this relationship will stay as it is till I die. And I think I was really worried. I had a lot of fear that I was losing myself, you know, to this relationship. And that this fun, spontaneous, wild person inside had to just be snuffed out because I was tired and I was emotional and I was alone a lot with my kid at home by myself in an apartment, scared to do anything, you know, feeling very scared with anything with my kid. If my kid is colicky, crying, my kid was a terrible sleeper. So she literally would wake up for like two hours straight from like two to four a.m. for months. Mm. And I was alone dealing. And I remember what happened was my husband took this whole having a baby as in, oh, okay, now we're in this next phase of our life where we have to save money, we have to be responsible, we're growing up. And every time he would say things like that, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I was like, I want to go out and I want to have fun. And, you know, even though I was so tired and I'd be like, I want to go to Blue Marlin, which interestingly enough, I went to for the first time in my life last month. Okay. And I've been married eight years, but in my first or second year of marriage, I just wanted to go out all the time. I lost all the baby weight. And I think a big part of it was, no, I'm, I just don't want to be the girl who had a baby who hasn't lost the baby weight and is at home all the time, depressed, right? Do you feel like you were rebelling against the situation in some way? Yes. I think I was rebelling against my life and the person I'd become who I didn't know and who I rejected. I didn't want to just be the mother, even though I loved my kid. So it's not that it was postpartum, but there was something there mm. where I felt like this is not who I want to be. Like, is this it, basically? Is this it? You know, and when I 
I, and I felt so guilty, so what I would do is I would exercise every day because that was the only thing that I allowed myself to do away from my child where I wouldn't feel guilty about. So it's like, oh, I'm going to exercise to lose the baby weight, so it's okay. And that one hour was the only time where I wasn't with my child, essentially. And so it was like my freedom. And so I lost this baby weight like right away, and it, it was crazy. I lost more. I was the thinnest I'd ever been in my life basically, if that was even possible. And I wanted to go out all the time. And we would fight because my husband would be like, this is not you. You never want to go clubbing. Like, okay, you like to go out for dinner or whatever, but this is not, this is not who I signed up to be with because this is not who you are, right? And I think there was a huge disconnect between us because I felt like he, he doesn't get me. He doesn't understand me, you know? And, and I think we got very close to... I don't want to say we got close to divorce, but we got to a place where I think I convinced myself that it didn't make sense to be with him anymore. And I think we fought so much that he got to the point where he thought, this is not the relationship I want either. I think therapists right? call this the slippery slope, no? Like the slippery slope to divorce. You're not quite there, but if you don't turn things around quickly, it's I, heading there. Yeah, look, I think... I don't think that people leave each other because of the big things. Mm. Okay, so according to research, 80% of couples that divorce do it because of a lack of emotional closeness, not because of affairs or big things. So in that sense, what really happens, why people leave each other is because this, there's a distance that's grown in their relationship and it happens so slowly and gradually, but it happens. And I think that's what happened. I was so naive and I didn't know all these things about relationships that now are available and accessible and you can go to workshops and you can listen to podcasts and you can watch YouTube videos and understand relationships better. But at the time, that wasn't really there, right? You didn't have access to that. And I, and I think that's what was happening with me where I wasn't able to communicate what I needed. Had I said, when you say these things, I feel like, you know, I can't breathe because I need to feel like, you know, that the, my youth and that fun period of our lives is not over. And if I had communicated that in a way that he could understand, maybe he would have been more accommodating. Maybe he would have said, oh, so you just want to go clubbing so you can feel like, you know, our life is not over? Sure, let's do it. Yeah. But I think there was a lot of resentment there. And it took a really long time to realize. I think it was when there was this one time where we said really, really horrible things to each other. We were so mean. I was so mean. And then I came home, I remember, and he was already contemplating how we were going to divide our time with our kids and what we were going to do about our living situation. And I had, in that moment, like real fear because I didn't think... In my head, I had deluded myself thinking into, maybe this is what I want. I know in the back of my mind, I thought, I thought this is what I want, right? But when I had my husband actually contemplating the logistics of it and talking to me about it, I, there was so much panic, and I realized, that's actually not what I want. You know, and we're so naive like that in our relationships because we don't, we think our partner doesn't get us and they don't know us, but we're also, you know, kind of assisting in that. We're also, we have a part in that. We don't, we don't ask our partners what their day was like. We don't ask them what they need. We don't ask how they want to be shown love. We don't do any of these things. And then we complain about it all the time. So how did you guys turn things around? And how long did that phase last for? I think that phase lasted for a good year and a half to two years. Not, not two years, I'll say a little bit less, but ever, you know... Like right before I had my kid and that whole year, my, my child's first year was very difficult. I think how we turn it around, one of the things, and it, it takes time, I, th I think I'm still repairing that period. I think I'm still trying to make up for it. I think that there's still this paranoia, you know, um, with, my, with my partner and with myself. Like I feel like I'm still trying to make up for it. But the, the thing that I would say helped turn it around is really realizing that it, it wasn't what I wanted. When push comes to shove, I thought, no, I actually want to be with this person. And I do. And, and knowing that, really finally knowing that, and knowing that I have a really good thing. And, you know, nothing is perfect, but I have a really good thing. And I'm abusing this person by not communicating what I need, by not having conversations, by expecting them to understand me, by expecting them, you know, they should know. And there was a lot of negativity. And it's what the Gottmans call the negative affect. So the negative influence or outlook in your relationship. There was a lot of negativity there, you know. And then over time, I, we, we worked on that. 
And I think only this year, I think this is my best year in my relationship. I'd like to say touch wood, which is not really around, but I think it's the best year because... Knock in my head. Yeah, <laughs> this is like the time where I'm most in tune with relationships and I really um, try. I'm really aware. So even when I do things that I don't want to do, and that's something I want couples to know, that even when you learn or you go to workshops and you do these things, there will be times where you'll ignore that and you'll go, you'll revert to old habits and you'll do things that you shouldn't do. But there is a point where you, because you've learned and now you're aware, you realize what you've done. You're not, it's not, it's not something that's not in your conscious. You're very aware. And it's how you come back from that. So it's when I tell myself, you know, I was really mean or I was really rude and I'll come back and I say, I'm sorry that I said that. That's actually not what I meant. What I meant was this, this, this. And I, when you said this specific thing, and be very factual, not what the person, you assume what the person said. But like when you aren't accusing and you aren't putting words in their mouth. But I, when I say, you said this, and when you specifically said this, that's how that made me feel, and that's why I reacted that way. And you can have a whole conversation around that. So what does it take to build a strong relationship? Well, I think... There's many things, but I think what it takes is really knowing your partner. You know, there's so many couples, their whole relationship is built on a social construct. So it's, their whole relationship is about their social life. And they don't realize that all they do is spend time with other people. And they prefer, it almost becomes boring. And it's not fun to do things on their own. And it's not always just other people. I would say it's the same with kids. When your kids or your social life group outings always take the front seat and your relationship is always second to that and it's never a priority, that's how we start losing each other, right? So I think one of the things we have to do to have a good relationship is spend time together, is be curious about each other. So ask each other questions and make one-on-one -on -one time you know, a priority. And I don't mean one-on-one -on -one time as in you have to go on an out, right? You can stay home on a couch and that could be an amazing experience. If you sit there and have serious or intimate, deep conversations without any screens around. It's not because you're sitting in the same room watching a TV, the same TV screen or, or different screens that happen sometimes. That doesn't mean you're doing something together just because you're next to each other. And sometimes P uh, couples will, will delude themselves into thinking they spend so much time together and they spend every night together when they don't really because they don't talk. They're just, they're just sitting next to each other. They're in the same space, but they're not sharing anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say it's not quantity, it's quality. So think of all your time together, your one-on-ones as interactive. Are they interactive? So are you interacting with each other? right? So that's a really big thing mm. to think about. If you're just sitting there, even if you're watching the same TV show and you're commenting on what's happening in the TV show, that's not quality time, mm. right? The goal is always to grow together as a couple and to move through time together. And you do this by really knowing each other and really supporting each other. Um, and actually, research has also shown that couples who know each other really well have a very amazing or great, I won't say amazing, but great sex life. So that's something to also know. You know, when you feel you are known by your partner, then you have, you're more into them, you know? And, and so that's something to consider. When we, we have to spend time really talking with each other, looking to each other's eyes, you know, asking. We, the thing is, these are all these questions we ask each other in the beginning of our relationships, and then we stop. And then all our time together is, even when we go out to dinners, it's always, what do we talk about? And I, me, someone who's been doing these courses and who's certified to do certain things in relationship therapy, I, I still found this very interesting because on my husband's birthday, I'll give you an example. We went out to dinner and we usually do one-on-ones, not every week, but we do one-on-ones often enough. And we went out to dinner and we did something called the love map exercise, which when you do my course, you will also um, find out about, find out about and, and get to do as well. So we did a love map exercise and I said to him, you know, I, we have this exercise, so come on, let's pick a few questions and do it. Right. And when we did that and we had the conversations we had, it was really surprising to me because I thought, when was the last time we talked about our dreams or his fears or mine and things? And I learned something about him that I didn't know. And he told me something that was so surprising that I didn't know he remembered about me. He remembered what we were wearing on my first date, what I was wearing on my first date, which was pretty intense, right? It's crazy. So, but it's 
these are conversations we haven't had in a really long time, right? Maybe when we were dating. All our conversations, and this is me thinking we're connected, were about, you know, we just bought a house. So it's about what we're going to do with the house. Mm. It's about our kids. Yeah. It's about our plans. It's maybe about work, but it's all um, surface level stuff, right? It's not deep. And it was very interesting that, no, people don't do this. People don't actually delve deep and have really interesting conversations where they really learn about each other and relearn because we grow, right? And we change and we have different experiences. And we have to understand that our pro we don't stop growing just when we got married. So there's things, there's deeper layers and there's things about our partners that we need to learn and know as we grow with them, right? Have you come across any helpful resources for couples, something that can help them start a conversation Uh, I know that there's a company called School of Life that publishes really good conversation card decks, which you can use to start a, a deeper, more meaningful conversation with the person you're with, whether it's a friend or a partner. But other than Love Maps, have you come across anything you could recommend? Um, I'm biased because I think Love Maps are brilliant, you know, but there are, there are so many things out there. You could Google it. I, I can just, I can give you a few questions as, as tips. People can yeah, go try this it. out. So one of the questions is, what is your partner's favorite tree? And how you would do this is you would ask your partner that question, but you would answer for them, right? And then they, then they would answer for you. And if you get it wrong, answering for them. If you get that wrong, the idea is to gently correct them and then tell them what the right answer is. And then the partner who got the, the answer wrong should just show more curiosity. So really, how come or why is that, yeah. right? So that's how that works. But one of the questions is, what's your favorite tree? Um, describe in as many details as possible your partner's day, either today or yesterday. Yeah. Um, who outside of your partner's parents are they closest to from their family mm -hmm. and why? What is one of their best experiences from childhood? Mm -hmm. Another one is, what is their favorite movie? Okay, so I'll give you the last one. I feel like I've given you a lot for free. But <laughs> <laughs> one of the last ones is, what is a current fear that your partner has? Mm. Okay, and so these are like, I think, six questions that I've given you. But these are things that you can, you can use. And there's a New York Times article, an old one actually, that came out, and I think it was 30 questions that lead to love. Yeah, I okay. remember that. That, yeah. went, that went viral for a while. Yes, exactly, yeah. it did. And you can find that online. It's, it, was, it was in the New York Times, and it was these psychologists who did a study, and based on that, they had the questionnaire, and they came out with all the questions that help you know if this is the person that you should be with, or not this is the person you should be with, sorry. It was questions to help you know if your relationship can lead to love, right? Because you would ask these questions and know the person better. Yeah. So that's also online and that's a resource that's available, right? When you're asking the questions, I was answering them in my head. I'm like, I feel like, I feel like I know most of the answers except what's his favorite tree. <laughs> You'd be surprised. With the Gottmans, I was lucky enough to be able to watch videos of live uh, therapy sessions going on, okay? And there was this couple who'd been together since they were 15 years old, okay? And... When the question came up with the tree, his wife, she looked at her partner, she's like, oh, he doesn't have a favorite tree, you know? And then he said, actually, I do. I can't remember the name of the tree, yeah. but the story behind it was that when he was growing up, his neighbors had that tree, and it was a very tall tree, and he used to climb it with his friends, and they could see their whole neighborhood from that tree. Yeah. And that was something she didn't know, even though they had been together since they were 15, and they were in their like mid thirties at that point when they um, yeah. had that, uh, when I saw that video. So you'd be surprised things you'll learn. Yeah. You know, I know what I'm doing this weekend. There you go. Playing the game. <laughs> There you go. And you know, just one thing that I want to say about this is you don't need resources to ask these questions. You know, I mean, it's instinctual. Think about all the things you want your partner to know about you and then ask them about them. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other things can couples do to better their relationship? Okay, there are many ways. One of the things that I want to talk about first is this group outings, that we, sh we should really stop group outings so much and focus on more one-on-ones as couples. Second thing is about this idea of socializing together. Well, 
It's two different things. It doesn't make sense to go out with a group of people just to hang out alone. Then if that's what you're going to do or spend time just together, you might as well go out on your own, you know? And I think it's very important to be able to do both. Having friends, having a social circle is very important for a couple to thrive. Having couple friends and building a social network together. That is a very big thing. So I'm not discounting that. You should do that. You should have a group and make plans with them. But it should take as much priority and as much um, precedent as doing one-on-one -on -one as well. There could be an equal balance where you say, when we want to spend time together and focus on our relationship, we're going to go out alone. Sometimes it'll be outside, maybe it'll be at home, but we'll spend quality time together. And then we'll do also the group thing. But what typically happens, I think, is a lot of couples, and they don't realize this, they spend so much time doing group things and group vacations mm -hmm. and um, group dinners and outings or, you know, barbecues. And then it's that or it's family time, family barbecues, family vacations. And, and they just don't spend, they don't realize that they haven't spent enough time one-on-one -on -one outside of sitting on a couch at night, tired, watching or streaming something on TV right? And that's not quality time. So what they don't realize is they're not spending quality time. So to answer your question, my take or my um, stance on group outings is it's fun. You should do it, but you should also be spending equal amounts of time doing one-on-one -on -one things mm -hmm. that are interactive mm -hmm. where you're really bonding. Mm -hmm. Give us more free advice. Okay. Uh, I've got some of those. Uh, another thing is the six second kiss or embrace. So that's something that the Gottmans teach. And there is a lot of science behind that, okay? And how, what we should do, and there should be a ritual that you build. The Gottmans call it the ritual of connection. And that's something that we should do is consider every morning or at any point during your day, you can decide to share a six second passionate kiss or a very tight hug. It doesn't work if it's just a loose one arm um, or like a little peck yeah. it doesn't work and i mean six seconds as in not one two three four five six right but like a slow proper count of six count seconds. mississippi Lee. right exactly right and i think do that and that science has shown that when you do that there is endorphins that go through your body and you start your if you do it in the morning which i think is the best time you start your day on a very positive yeah. note right? But you can do it anytime, wherever feels comfortable for both of you. Maybe you have different schedules. Maybe someone wakes up really early or someone does night shifts. I don't know how, you know, people's relationships work, but pick a time and commit to a six second kiss or a tight hug. Okay. So that's something you should do. Another thing that you can do is make sure your partner doesn't leave for the day without you knowing one thing that's happening in their day. And that's a really good way of being connected, right? So the time that you will be apart, know something. It could be a meeting. It could be something with school. It could be an errand. It could be an important task or presentation or something that's going on. Know one thing that's going on in your partner's day. Is that so that you can ask them about it or is it that just to create a connection between the two of you? It's both. It's A, to be connected, yeah. to know something that's going on with your partner. So it's essentially a way of knowing each other, you know. And it's also a, a way of having communication, of bringing you together. Because once you know something's going on in their day, then at one point, whether it's through a phone call or when you see each other again, you will ask each other, so what happened with that? Or did you manage to do that? Or what? So it is a point of reference for conversation as well. Another thing I would say is listening. So we have to learn, and I think this is easier said than done, but practice makes perfect, and that's the whole point. And even when it's not perfect, we are just practicing because that's life, and we're always just learning and trying our best. But learning to speak and to listen to your partner is really important. Listening without an agenda, listening without having a response, mm. right? We do that so often. That's so hard. Like, I, I don't know if it's a women thing, but I... I have m my reflexes to try and fix the problem and to try and offer a solution. Mm -hmm. You're not the only one. We, lots of people have that. And men do that, you know, more often than women. But even women do that, too. We always feel like the goal is to fix the problem or to come up with a solution. But that's never the goal. Yeah. When someone tells you something, whether it's your husband or your wife, you know, which doesn't matter which sex you are, but when someone tells you something... The goal is always empathy. That's yeah. what they want. 
They want support. So even if you don't agree with what they're saying, you always have to show your partner through a conversation that you have their back because they're telling you something that might be bothering them or something that is um, they're very excited about or something that you know they just want to talk through. They don't want answers. So we, if, if we tell ourselves every time we listen that the condition is, I'm listening without giving an answer because that's, what, that's not what they want. I'm listening with no agenda other than empathy. Mm. That at the end of this conversation, my partner feels that they were supported and they were heard. And there's a lot of ways to do this. First of all, eye contact. Don't be on your phone or looking around when the person's telling you something. Don't interrupt them to talk about something different, even if it's something that you feel is important or urgent at that point. Let them get through what they need to say, right? Another thing is ways to show our partner that we're listening is murmurs of um, empathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right? Things so like that. react to what they're saying. Don't say react quiet. React to what they're saying, okay? And then another thing to show, there's a lot of phrases that we can use. I feel you. That sucks. Yeah. I'm sorry you have to deal with that. I understand. You know, just to bring it back to your point earlier on about how important it is to communicate to the other person exactly what it is you need. When, I, when I'm telling Salem about something that's happened in my day or when I'm complaining about something or opening up about something, I've, I usually want his input and problem solving. But I've never explained that to him. And when he's telling me something, he just wants me to be quiet and listen. But he never explained that to me. So I would always sit there and, and offer and, and try to problem solve with him. And he would just get frustrated. And it got to a point where communication sort of came to a standstill. And then we, I can't, I can't really remember how it happened, but, I, but we had a conversation where he told me, when I tell you things, I just want you to listen. And I told him, okay, good. When I tell you things, please help me solve the problem. And now we know, like we know what the other person needs in those moments. And it's made the communication a lot easier in that way. Yeah, look, it goes back to this idea that, you know, the person is not a, a mind reader, right? So at the end of the day, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, and in fact, I advocate this. Start, if you want something specific out of this conversation and you feel like you haven't figured it out yet or you haven't mastered the communication between you, which, you know, is maybe in every conversation you want different things too. It's fair to say in the beginning, so I have this thing I want to talk to you about, but I don't want you to give me an answer. I just really want to talk to you about it because it's getting to me. And so they understand that they just want you, they just want support or empathy, right? Or saying, so I have this thing and I'm not sure about it and I really would like your input, but can you just hear me out till the very end and then maybe give me your advice on this? And then you go ahead. You can preempt the conversation yeah. by asking what you need before that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. So many great gems in this conversation, Najla. Thank, thank you, you so much. I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much for being on the podcast thank today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. If you're not familiar with goodness, head to www.goodness.me to access the online platform and articles and follow us at goodness on Instagram. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review and share it. And we'll see you next week.